we are live. Ms. Bhai, you can start. Okay, ma'am. A very good evening to one and all present here. A warm welcome to all the viewers and our today's speaker, Dr. Kirti Chawla, ma'am. I am Ms. Bakadri, social media head of Synodent. I am the host for the today's webinar along with the co-host Dr. Pratik Bum. I would like to thank Dr. Anmol Bagaria, ma'am, who is founder and CEO of Synodent for organizing this amazing webinar. Synodent is a unique platform, first time in India, a, dig a digital healthcare platform that provides and enhances a good relationship between patients and doctor, also enable a real-time appointment scheduling system. Our goal is to create an easy access to healthcare services and communication ways or appointment scheduling system, not only between patients and dentists, but also for medical practitioner, di diagnostic lab to radiological service and pharmaceutical service and also research and educational programs. For doctors to enhance their knowledge and keep them updated regarding the same. Synodin bring together at economic prices and minimum waiting time because everyone has 24 hours and everyone want to utilize without wasting time. Synodent is here to create spacious smile and healthy smile on our pa patient's faces with minimum efforts and maximum welfare. Synodent is an initiative that will put up all its effort to create that beautiful smile on our patient's face always. Now patients don't have to fear of those long queues and busy dentists when they get a toothache. Synodent is also working for social welfare and humanity to enhance the quality of life by providing health care needs and health awareness and free treatment. So I'm very glad to have you all here with us and I hope you all are excited for the webinar. Today's topic is tips and tricks in periodontology. I would like to invite Dr. Kirti Chawla, ma'am. She has done BDS and MDS from Molana Ajad Institute of Dental Sciences, New Delhi. She is gold medalist of Delhi University with 30 awards and 3 distinctions. She is diplomat in WCOI. She is currently associate professor, Department of Periodontology and Faculty of Dentistry in Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. She secured first rank in Delhi University in, University in BDS first, second and third year and secured second rank in the Delhi University in BDS final year examination. Also, she secured first rank in Delhi University in MDS examination. She has been awarded distinction in human anatomy and histology material used in dentistry and oral pathology and microbiology. She has done courses of health research fundamentals and patent law for engineers and scientists by NPTEL. She has been experienced senior resident at Molana Azad Institute, Dental Sciences, New Delhi, reader at ITS Dental College Hospital and Research Center. And currently she is an assistant professor at Faculty of Dentistry, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. She has patent of an invention called laser oral therapeutic device. She has been received research grant for research by CSIR under the scientist pool scheme, ICEMR, American Society for Laser Medicine and Surgery, Center for International Cooperation in Sciences. She is passionate, dedicated and researcher who has published various papers in national and international journals. She is chairperson and keynote speaker in national and international conferences. Uh, she has done various media presence and interviewed various program on national news channels. She is editor at Ecta Scientifica Dentist, uh, Dental Sciences, Scholar, De Scholar Journal of Dental Sciences, Nigerian Journal of Experimental and Clini Clinical Biosci Biosciences, International Journal of Oral and Craniofacial Sciences, International Journal of Dental Research and Oral Sciences. She is life member of Indian Society of Periodontology, Indo-Pacific Academy of Forensic, Forensic Odontology, Indian Society of Dental Research. She has been awarded the Best Outgoing Student Award for the year 2005 by the Pierre Focard Academy, ICD Merit Award in 2005 for Oral Surgery by the International, by the International College of Dentistry, TL Kurana Medal for the Best Student in Dental Surgery, First prize at 34th National Conference in Indian Society of Periodontology in Dharwar. Best Resident Abstract Laser Dental Application Session at the 35th SLMS Annual Conference in Florida. Consolation Prize at IDEM 2016 held at Singapore. Excellence in Periodontics Award by IHPA in 2017. Accommodation of the Year by the, dental, by the Indian Dental Diva Award in 2018. Accommodation of the Year by the IERP in 2018, Young Scientist in Dentistry by the Venus International Research and second prize at 5th Global American Academy of Implant Dentistry and awarded many more prestigious award of dentistry of her incredible work. 
Now I would like to request Dr. Kirti Chawla, ma'am, to continue the webinar. Good evening, all. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Ba, for that warm welcome and a nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Sinodent and Dr. Anmol Vagaria for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, Dr. Pratik Bo. Uh, here I am from Delhi. Uh, it's a nice chilly winter evening here. Uh, before uh, starting my lecture, I would uh, just like to share what I would be discussing in Perio. Uh, periodontology is a very vast uh, subject. We would be uh, we would be like uh, sh I'll be sharing my cases and I'll be discussing what to do in a perio patient. First, how to diagnose that for a general dentist and what to do next and when should you call in a periodontist, right? I just start sharing my screen. So what's your understanding with the word periodontal disease? Is it just scaling or is it beyond scaling? See, periodontal disease is not just doing scaling for the patient. Scaling is just one of the parts of the therapy. Periodontal disease ranges from periodontitis to recessions, gingival recessions. You have periodontal pockets chronic periodontitis, you have gingival enlargements, you have epulis formations, abscess formations, you have gingivitis, which is the simplest form of the disease. So how would you go about diagnosing a patient? Uh, you ask the patient his chief complaint. The patient would come to you with a lot of complaints. He can complain of bleeding gums. He can complain of mobile teeth. He can complain of uh, uh, receding gums. Mo uh, then uh, he can complain of uh, a lot of uh, bad odor from the mouth. So what would you do? Once the patient comes to you, you would first take his history. What is his history? Since when is he facing this problem? What is his dental history? Has he ever got any treatment done? What is his systemic history, which is very important, whether the patient is systemically healthy or the patient is suffering from diabetes or hypertension or any other cardiovascular disease. His social habits are equally important. Uh, when the patient is coming to you, you have to ask his social habits, whether he is a tobacco chewer or he is a smoker. All these are taken into account when you are diagnosing a periodontal patient because periodontitis is not one, uh, not governed by one factor. It is a multifactorial disease. Multiple factors are involved. We take the family history because genetics is also involved. Once you have taken your history, you should take, do the clinical periodontal examination. Why is it important that you do an extraoral examination is that sometimes the lymph nodes are also involved due to periodontal infection. So you should be always doing extraoral uh, examination. You should check for any lymph node enlargements. You should check for any TMJ derangements because this can happen because of the pathologic migration in the patient that's occurring. Then comes intraoral examination where you check the patient's oral hygiene status. You ask the patient, how many times he is brushing, whether he's brushing twice a day or he's brushing once a day, what type of brush he's using, what type of paste he's using. Then comes your aesthetics. Is the patient aesthetically uh, conscious or not? The patient is a fa female patient or a male patient. All these things are important. Once you have done this general examination, then you do your periodontal tissue examination. Periodontal tissue examination would include your color, contour, position, shape, and consistency of the gingiva. This is very important. The normal color of the gingiva you would see is coral pink color. If you see the color changes in the gingiva, that means there is inflammation. Inflammation of the gingiva you can see as a reddish pink 
color of the gingiva. In case you see that the gingiva has turned from red to blue, if it is a blue color gingiva, then it means it's a pocket formation. Okay? So this is very important part to see the color of the gingiva. Then comes the contour. If the gingiva is scalloped or the scalloping is lost, what is the position of the gingiva? Is it above the CEJ or it has receded below the CEJ? Then the shape of the gingiva, that is the interdental shape between the two teeth. If this embrasure is filled with the gingiva or this embrasure is lost, the consistency of the gingiva, it is whether this consistency is firm or the gingiva has become soft. If, you, if the consistency is soft, that means the periodontal disease has set in. Now, if the consistency is leathery, that means the patient has turned, gone into a fibrotic phase. The disease has crossed the inflammatory phase. So all these are very important factors that should be considered in mind. So after doing this uh, clinical examination, you should be doing a basic periodontal examination. Whether you are a periodontist or you are a general dentist, you should have one WHO probe with you so that you diagnose the patient correctly before referring the patient to the periodontist. What is important is, uh, what is the pocket depth when you are uh, examining the patient? If there are no pockets, more than 3.5 mm, then you give a scoring of zero and no, there is no indication of periodontal therapy. But you have to keep one thing in mind here. It's not just 3.5 mm. There should be no calculus, no bleeding after probing, and there should be no color changes of the gingiva. If there is color change, because this is the, because this is the first sign, first object, uh, subjective sign of periodontal disease setting in. So if there is no color change, no pocket depth, no calculus, no bleeding after probing, there is no indication for periodontal therapy. Then comes score one, two, three, four, which are progressive in nature. One, there would be no pockets but there would be bleeding after probing. Two, there would be no pockets, but there would be supragingival, subgingival calculus or overhangs. In both the cases, you just give the patient oral hygiene instructions and you do the oral profile access for the patient. Now comes when the score is three and four. Three and four means that the pocket depth has increased from 3.5 to 5.5 or more than 5.5 pocket depth. In these cases, you have to refer to a periodontist okay. and a star hysterics means there is vocation involvement then again you should be referring to a periodontist if you're a general dentist and in case you're a periodontist you just do the oral hygiene root surface debridement and I'll be discussing what would be the treatment plan for the same the British Society has given guidelines for the basic periodontal examination which is available at this website okay. yeah these are the guidelines that are available at the website uh, mentioned here. So why, when should you do a comprehensive periodontal examination? A comprehensive periodontal examination means full mouth periodontal charting. When you should be doing that? You should be doing that for patients having a score of three, four or vacation involvement is there. You can use these probes. This is a Williams probe. And this is a UNC 15 Pro. And this is a UNC 15 Pro. And this is a vocation probe that is called the neighbor's probe. So these probes are used. And when you should be doing it, when there is vocation involvement, bleeding on probing, suppuration, deep pocket depths, and gingival recession. So for these patients, you would be doing comprehensive periodontal examination to decide on the treatment planning. The next assessment would be radiographic examination. What all you can do in a radiograph? You take OPG or you take intraoral periapical radiograph. It depends whether the patient has a generalized or a localized problem. If the, patient is, if the problem is localized, you take an IOPA. 
if the patient if the problem is generalized then you take an opd see here you can see a lot of bone loss this is all bone loss and overhanging margin here so all these factors have to be taken into consideration here there is some periopical pathology developing so the all these factor have to be taken into consideration when there is a generalized loss present this radiograph it shows an apical periodontitis case or an endoperio lesion through this pocket the infection has spread to the apex of the tooth this iops shows a vertical bone loss a vertical bone loss means that the pocket depth is lower than the alveolar bone And this one shows a horizontal bone loss. So all these assessments have to be made before you decide on any of the periodontal treatments you are planning. Now let's come to periodontal treatment. So treatment could be either solely closed treatment or a solely open treatment or closed followed by open treatment depending on your assessment of the patient so these are uh, first after you've taken your clinical findings medical history provisional diagnosis and systemic uh, history of the patient you do the oral hygiene and uh, oral hygiene motivation instruction of the patient and a professional tooth cleaning is done initially you do a supra gingival treatment and then a subgingival treatment and then you reassess the patient so what would you do for a subgingival treatment you would do a closed pocket therapy that could be subgingival cleaning or a gingival curettage so closed pocket therapy would be root planing or curettage which is a surgical procedure but it's a closed procedure then you reevaluate now after reevaluation if the pocket depths are still more than 5 mm or there is something called as clinic critical probing depth which is 4.2 mm if these pocket depths are more than 4.2 or 5 mm then you plan a surgical treatment and you do a follow up after the surgical treatment the most important part in perio treatment is the supportive periodontal treatment or the maintenance recall now this recall depends on the patient now if the patient is maintaining a good oral hygiene this would be 6 months for a patient with good oral hygiene now if the patient is not maintaining good oral hygiene his pocket depths are not reducing much then this would be 3 months and if it's if the patient is very critical he has a lot of vocation involvement he is not able to maintain the plaque scores are 2 3 then the recall is 1 month now for the patients who are systemically uh, not healthy there is a asa classification to find out if the patients can be safely treated or not now the class 1 patients are normal healthy patients class 2 have mild systemic disease three have severe systemic disease but that is not life threatening so both of these two 1 2 and 3 can be treated but patients having 4 5 6 score that is severe systemic disease which is constantly life threatening moribund patients or brain dead patients you need a patient's consent and even for severe systemic disease you should for severe systemic disease you should consult the patient's physician these are important factors 
when you are doing your initial diagnosis and treatment planning so once you have decided you have diagnosed the patient you decide what uh, what treatment is to be taken up you do a non surgical or a surgical therapy let us discuss what all options you have for doing a non surgical therapy okay. for a non surgical therapy the first part is scaling and root planing you you can use either hand instruments or ultrasonic instruments you must there is a lot of confusion between whether you should be using hand instruments or whether you should be using ultrasonics but what is important is ultrasonic instrumentation if used properly it is it it is a very good choice when one considers the demands of clinical skill time and stamina the instrument of choice for universal application would appear to be either a sonic or a ultrasonic scaler the second question that comes in mind is whether you should do a full mouth scaling or you should be doing quadrant wide approaches you should recall the patient uh, it is said that an hour or less of a full mouth treatment is as effective as a four hours of quadrant wise approach so you should try to do a full mouth uh, ultrasonic uh, scaling for the patient because the main source of microbial contamination on the root surface is the bacterial biofilm and it is biofilm disruption or removal that is the treatment goal the second treatment modality uh, that i would be discussing for non surgical is local drug delivery these are procedures that probably a general dentist can also do okay. for a local drug delivery you do it for patients with 5 to 7 mm of pocket who are systemically healthy or they have mild disease okay. so these are two important considerations when you doing local drug delivery and patients who are not having generalized problems these patients have localized problems one or two tooth are involved in the whole oral cavity for these patients you can try doing local drug delivery so you have different types you can do an irrigation you can use sustained release devices you can use a perio chip you can use controlled release drugs i'll be discussing some commercially available uh, local drug delivery agents one of them is elizol uh, this one is by colgate it contains 25% metronidazole benzoate so the effective time for this is 24 to 36 hours how it is applied it comes in a capsule with which has a special cannula this is a special cannula and this is the capsule right and you put this directly into the pocket this gel would solidify once it is it is in contact with the gingival fluid and this application should be repeated after 7 days the second one is atridox uh it has 8.5% doxycycline hyclate it must be refrigerated it should not be kept like that it must be refrigerated it is available in a two syringe system as you can see here this is a two syringe system and uh, it is ready for use after coupling the two syringes back or forth 50 times can you see here you just couple it couple these two syringes and you move this back and forth 50 times and after that you place it into the pocket after placing you quickly remove this cannula because after placing this also solidifies in the pocket the next uh, local drug available is arestin that is this is 1 mg minocycline hydrochloride it is in powder form this is in powder form these micro micro corpuscles these are powder form and uh, the powder is blown via air pressure within the metal tip into the pocket this is the metal tip and from here you apply the air pressure so that arestin enters the pocket and each pocket will 
receive an individual portion. So each capsule will be used for one pocket. The next one available in the market is Perio Chip. Perio Chip is two point five percent chlorhexidine gluconate. This is also refrigerated because uh, in warm temperatures this becomes very flimsy and becomes very difficult to place in the pocket. This should be placed at least five mm. into the pocket and left there there is one more available uh, in india which is tetracycline fibers where by the name ab plus these are tetracycline fibers you just take few fibers with a tweezer and you place them in the pocket uh, but the disadvantage with this one is that these fibers they come out of the pocket so it is uh, a good practice to apply a periodontal pack after you place these fibers in the pocket so that they stay there for some time the next uh, non surgical therapy that the patient can be given is systemic antibiotics we have to be very very careful when you are or ad uh, advising antibiotics because there are chances of developing antibiotic resistance so sites which most commonly fail to respond to root surface debridement are usually difficult to instrument these sites then you give the patient a systemic antibiotic uh, there may be a need for chemical agents such as antibiotics to act as an adjunct to mechanical debridement at non responding sites since bacteria are the initial agents of periodontal diseases systemically or locally administered antibiotics are considered as possible adjuncts for their control when the mechanical therapy uh, you are unable to uh, control the disease with solely mechanical therapy okay or the patient has some systemic disorder you advise antibiotics if the patient has pyrexia lymph node involvement and swelling in the facial spaces that may require the use of antibiotics but this should be the exception rather than the norm because very few cases of periodontitis you would find patient having fever or lymph node involvement it will be only present if the patient has opiculitis or the patient has some abscess um, that has developed acutely it is very it's a very important question when should you use an antibiotic so if you've given a periodontal therapy whether non surgical or surgical and it is successful you don't need any antibiotics but if the patient is not responding to the treatment then you would go either for a microbiologic test uh, which is very rarely done here and then prescribe the antibiotic and do a follow up test and to the maintenance therapy right because if you have a positive pathogenic flora then you have to find the antibiotic sensitivity the most uh, common antibiotics used for periodontal treatment are amoxicillin tetracycline and doxycycline you can use any other tetracycline but doxycycline is the most common one used this covers your anaerobic regime and this covers your aerobic bacteria okay and doxycycline that is tetracycline these are the only antibiotics that enter the gingival sulcus we have some current recommendations for the use of antibiotics they should be considered in periodontal treatment they should be considered but not used in all cases they should be considered only in following circumstances like aggressive periodontitis severe periodontal disease where you have multiple deep sites with pus discharge patients who fails to respond to conventional periodontal therapy that means refractory patients and if the patient is refractory first find out the reason why the patient is not responding to conventional periodontal treatment probably the treatment is not complete the subgingival deposits have not been removed properly 
or the patient has some system underlying systemic problem because of which he is not responding to periodontal therapy so before using antibiotics find out the reason why the patient is refractory periodontitis in case the patient has aggressive periodontitis that means the patient is less than 30 years of age and there is rapid bone loss then you can prescribe antibiotics and the most common used for this is doxycycline 100 mg you give two tablets stat followed by you give one tablet each day for 14 days so these this is the antibiotic prescribed for aggressive periodontitis now what if the patient has a periodontal abscess if the patient has a periodontal abscess then you would prescribe amoxicillin and metronidazole combination you give amoxicillin 500 mg thrice a day and metronidazole 400 mg thrice a day for 5 days. Now, what are the advantages or disadvantages of systemic therapy versus local therapy? See, when you are giving systemic, you have a broad, broad spectrum of activity. Whereas when you are giving local administration, the spectrum of efficacy is local, low, uh, at, is limited. But the disadvantage of systemic administration is there is low local concentration because the medicine is reaching via the bloodstream, whereas in local therapy, you are directly putting it in the pocket. So there is very high concentration, whereas in systemic therapy, the concentration is very low. The advantage of systemic administration, it achieves distant reservoirs of pathogenic microorganisms. But advantage of local is it is better effect against biofilms. Whereas disadvantage would be, there would be systemic side effects. The choice of antibiotic is determined with the pathogen. Whereas local administration, there is possible reinfection of the non-treated site. But when you see, uh, when you have a generalized periodontitis patient, you have who has pockets all around, it is better to go for a systemic approach. If you have a patient with local involvement, you have pockets here and there, one or two, then you can just do a topical application of the medicaments. The next therapy, which is the recent therapy, you do a host modulation therapy, where that means that you are modifying the host's immune response. See, initially I told you periodontitis is a multifactorial disease. So one of the factors is the host response. Just uh, how the host responds to the pathogenic bacteria. What is the host's immunity? What happens? So there are many drugs that have been used to modulate the host response, to increase the, uh, to break the chain of pathogenesis of uh, periodontitis. You can break the chain at the level of cytokines, prostanoids, MMPs, antigens, virulence factors. There are many points where you can break the chain of pathogenesis. And you can use different uh, drugs for that. You can use antibiotics, NSAIDs, diphosphonates, and chemically modified tetracyclines. All these drugs act at various levels. Now, if you see the antibiotics, they would act at the pathogenic microorganism level. The NSAIDs would act at the cytokines, prostanoids, and MMP. The diphosphonates or the bisphosphonates, they would disrupt the metabolism of connective tissue and bone. And CMT would act at the MMP level. Now, antibiotics, what is available in the market? Most of it is under research. The only available host modulation therapy uh, right now is doxycycline 20 milligrams, which comes with the name of periostat. This is the drug and you give this drug twice a day, BD, for three to nine months. Now, depends on what your, um, how your patient is presenting. Uh, this is used mostly in refractory patients and aggressive periodontitis patients, where you modulate the host's response to the disease because uh, the aggressive periodontitis patients is has a component of an autoimmune disorder. 
the patient's immunity is low that is why the periodontal disease sets in at a very rapid pace so this is this one is available uh, but this one is still not available in, in india so what you can do is you can use the 100 mg doxy and divide the dose into three parts and give it once a day for to the patient for 3 months and anecdotally i have found my patients have really responded well to this regime now once uh, you've given the patient non surgical therapy your patient uh, has responded but what about patients who have to go for surgical therapy if you are a periodontist you can try your hands on with the surgical therapy but if you are a general dentist please refer your patient to a periodontist uh, because these surgical procedures are very technique sensitive and they have to be done uh, with the with more precision okay why would you do a periodontal surgery you should you want a direct vision for root cleaning or debridement the pockets are very deep that you are unable to clean the subgingival deposits you want to reduce or eliminate plaque retentive areas that promote infection especially periodontal pockets you may want to eliminate uh, inflammation enhance the regeneration of periodontal tissues you want to do a bone graft procedure you want to do something gtr or you want to do a soft tissue graft for regeneration you want to do a resective therapy you want to do an osseous surgery you want to create a physiologic morphology or architecture of the marginal periodontium like in cases of altered passive eruption patients having altered passive eruption you want to uh, give them a physiologic morphology correction of mucogingival defects restoration of aesthetics in the alveolar dental tissues Uh, i would not be discussing this part in this lecture because this is a super specialized area so i would be just discussing the basic i'll just discuss a few of my basic cases that i have done important part for doing a surgery before doing a surgery is your patient selection what are the patient factors that are to be considered there are local factors like what form of periodontitis is present is it chronic or aggressive what is the extent and severity of the disease what is the magnitude uh, of plaque accumulation and what is the level of patient compliance if the patient is not compliant if he is or she is not maintaining oral hygiene there is no point doing any kind of surgery it will not help the patient what is the level of expression of the disease with regard to symptoms of activity or bleeding on probing then the behavior and compliance of the patient are alterable risk factors present like smoking cigarettes per day packs per year nutrition awareness of health status these are important parts systemic causes like general medical diseases genetically elicited syndromes stress psychic consequences and non alterable risk factors all these has to have to be taken into consideration before you go and decide that you want to do the surgery for the patient it's not just that you have done the scaling the pockets are not reducing you just go ahead and do a surgery it's not like that you have to consider a lot of factors before you tell the patient that a surgical intervention is required because what is the prognosis of the treatment you are doing a surgery the the prognosis of the treatment should be good you doing a surgery the patient is not being treated there's no point doing that surgery so the patient related factors could be local factors lifestyle factors systemic factors local factors is presence of plaque what is the plaque score bleeding what is the bleeding score of the patient you cannot open a flap if the patient is having bleeding on probing if the patient is still bleeding once you open up the flap the flap could necrose what is the compliance of the patient would the patient maintain a good oral hygiene then what are the systemic factors is is the patient a smoker is he ready to quit his habit what are the stress levels of the patients that is important and all these are they controllable if yes then you consider the local factors like defect factors what type of defect is present whether there is a horizontal bone loss whether there is a vertical bone loss whether there is a generalized defect there is a localized defect or whether there is an apical periodontitis if no then there 
it is cardiac prognosis, then you should rethink about doing a surgery. There are a lot of other factors that influence the treatment result. There could be bacterial contamination, wound healing potential of the patient, local factors and surgical procedures. Bacterial contamination can occur through plaque, smoking, use of antibacterial uh, agents, irrational use. If you're using irrationally these antibacterial agents, then wound healing would be affected by genetic predisposition, diabetic status of the patient, age of the patient. Local factors, how about type of occlusion? If the patient is having trauma from occlusion, you do a surgery, the disease was, will again set in. So initially you have to first treat the cause. You treat the trauma from occlusion. You correct the occlusion of the patient. What is the pulp condition of the patient? Tooth and defect morphology. All these are considered. Then comes the surgical procedure. What, what method would you do? What type of surgery would you do? I would be discussing what type of surgery is indicated and what type of procedure. Then how would you prepare the root surface? What is the ability of the therapist doing it? All these are very important factors that would influence your treatment result. So let me uh, just go through what are the indications of the surgical procedures. Access flap surgery, Periodontal flap surgery or open flap debridement, as you call it uh, generally, is usually indicated for visual access to periodontally involved root surfaces where you cannot even do subgengival scaling. You have to access that root surface, clean that root surface, cure it, the bone, remove the granulation tissue. In that case, you do a access flap surgery. Wedge excisions are done when there is a distally an end stand standing or a lone standing tooth that exhibits bony pockets. So a last tooth molar or a last tooth which has a pocket, you do a wedge excision in that patient. Regenerative methods, uh, they are done for vertical osseous defects, for cation involvements, for cation one or two, for cation three and four are not done for, are not indicator for regeneration. And for covering areas of gingival recession, class one and class two, you do regenerative methods. Resective procedures like osseous surgery, uh, crown lending, etc. Irregular alveolar bone loss when it is present or you want a more crown length, you do a osteoplasty or ostectomy. Gingivectomy or gingivoplasty, you do it for contouring the hyperplastic gingiva. If there is gingival overgrowth, then you do a gingivectomy or a gingivoplasty. Surgical percussion therapy uh, is done for class three for cation involvement, where you can do a hemisection of the roots or a root resection. Then comes your mucogingival plastic surgeries. These are done for progressive gingival recessions, alveolar ridge defects to eliminate aesthetic problems. If you want to increase the vestibular depth of the, of the uh, vestibule, or you want to do a phrenectomy or phrenotomy procedures. All these procedures would come under mucogingival plastic surgery. So I would be discussing only phrenectomy in this, mucogingival plastic surgeries. So what all instruments do you use while doing a surgical surgery? The basic instrument, you have instruments for incision, that is the blades, these blades and blade handles. You have elevators to elevate, these are periodontal elevators. You have needle holders. These are sutures. And to remove the granulation tissue, you use curates. Now, the most basic treatment that you do for uh, a surgical therapy, it's a closed therapy. Gingival curatage is a closed procedure. It can be done using a curate or using a blade. When you use a blade, it is called as ENAP. That is excisional new attachment procedure. And when you are using a curate, while doing it, it is called gingival curettage. This is done for pockets four to six mm, not more than that, because the shank of the curate, the length of the shank of the curate is not such that it can reach beyond six mm. So you do it for four to six mm of pocket depths. And what you do is 
that the cutting edge of the curate should be facing the gingival sulcus. And you remove this soft tissue pocket lining. This soft tissue pocket lining is removed and the tooth is left as it is. The healing time of gingival curatage is around two to three weeks. I'll just show you a case where the pocket depth was 5 mm. You can see the gingiva is very healthy, pink. There is no bleeding from uh, bleeding on probing in this region. But still the pocket depth, there's a localized pocket here that is around 5 mm. And after curatage, this pocket reduced to around 1 to 2 mm. And the gingiva has become, the bulk of the gingiva is also reduced in this case. Next comes the open flap debridement or access flap surgery. You do it for pockets more than 5 to 6 mm. When you have pockets more than 5 to 6 mm, you do a localized or a generalized flap surgery. If you have a generalized patient, then you do quadrant-wise surgery for a generalized periodontitis. Don't do a full mouth flap at one go, like a full mouth scaling. You just if there is a generalized uh, surgery patient, you do quadrant wise. You open up each quadrant at each visit and do a open flap debridement. Let me show you a case. So this is a general, uh, this is a localized uh, flap surgery that I'm showing you. The patient has pocket depths around 10 mm. I'm giving a circular incision. Now the blade is held just parallel to the tooth surface and I'm giving a circular incision here opening a full thickness peri uh, periodontal flap periosteal flap I am including the periosteum in the flap cleaning that area now the all the granulation tissue the deposits etc have been removed I'll just show you a video and I've given simple interrupted sutures and this is the post-operative picture after seven days. This is just at the time of suture removal. Can you still see these marks of the sutures here? So this is after seven days. So I'll just show you this video. Here he is giving a circular incision. This is not, uh, this is an internal bevel incision. He has left a, some parts of the tissues inside. He's doing a modified Widman flap here. Can you see here? This blade is directed towards the base of the pocket or the crest of the alveolar. Then you remove the diseased tissue from inside the flap. This is a modified Widman flap. The one, the case that I've shown is a Kirkland's flap or a, where I have given circular incision. This is modified Widman. Then you remove all the calculus disease tissue using your scalar. You are, he's doing root planing. He's polishing the roots. Root planing was done using a curant. Irrigating this area properly. And placing simple interrupted sutures. Now, the next question is whether you should be placing a flap uh, place, placing a pack or not? Uh, you should be placing the pack because it gives patient more comfort. A periodontal pack gives patients more comfort. The site is uh, is safe. The site is more safe uh, from the masticatory forces. You are the site is more protected. It is more protected from the masticatory forces from any other. If the patient the patient will not fiddle with the 
uh, sutures that are present in the mouth and the sutures will not loosen up. So it is a good practice to apply a periodontal uh, pack after a periodontal surgery. The next one that I would be discussing is regenerative surgery, where I would be showing you two cases. One would be bone grafting and the other would be guided tissue regeneration. Can you see the defect around the molars? The mesial pocket is around, say, 6 mm, and the distal pocket is 10 mm here. This is 10 mm, this is around 6 mm. I've given a circular incision. Uh, I am uh, more uh, prone to giving circular incisions because it saves the soft tissue. I only give uh, internal bevel incision where I want to reduce the amount of uh, the bulk of the gingiva, wherein there is gingival overgrowth. Because uh, after the flap surgery, there is some amount of recession because of the shrinkage of the gingiva. So I prefer giving a circular incision in my cases. Now, can you see, can you appreciate the defect? This is the defect measly and this is the defect distally. Uh, this is a crater type of a defect. Mm -hmm. I've placed bone graft material. You can use any uh, bone grafts. The gold standard is using an autograft, but the problem is from which site you would be taking it. So if the patient has an exostosis or something like that in uh, or buttressing bone in that region, then you can take an autograft. But if, you, if that is not there, you can use a xenograft or an alloplast or an allograft. Uh, but uh, the uh, very good results are with the xenografts. Alloplasts, sometimes they just become a capsule and they don't form bone. So if the patient doesn't have any problems using a xenograft that is procured from the animals, then you use a xenograft. One of the very good xenografts available is uh, BioOS. So I've placed these, the graft. As soon as you place the graft, you give the suture and then you place graft in the next site. Otherwise, this would be get contaminated. I've placed sutures and I've placed a pack. See, when you're doing a periodontal flap surgery without placing any graft material, or it's just an access flap surgery, you can remove the sutures after seven days. But if you're doing some grafting procedure, you should wait for at least 14 days. This is after 14 days, this site. The next case I would be showing is a guided tissue regeneration. Now this patient had an extruded central incisor and he had buccal pocket of around uh, 6 mm and a palatal pocket of around 9 mm. Again, a circular incision was made and a full thickness flap was reflected. Can you see this defect here on the palatal side? From the buccal side, the defect is not that visible. So you prepare a template using a foil. This foil is sterilized before making the template. Uh, you place the bone graft in that region and using this template, you cut your membrane. This membrane, you can use the available collagen membranes um, that are available. This is a membrane that is cut to shape. This is a bioresorbable membrane. There are non-resorbable membranes also available, but those membranes have to be removed after some time. This one would just resorb and form a part of the bone. Yeah, this is a J-shaped membrane. You can have an H-shaped or U-shaped or a T-shaped membrane, depending on the type of uh, defect that is there. For this case, we have used a J-shaped membrane. Membrane placed, sutures given. Now this is the 
pre-operative picture where you have this defect and this is the post-operative picture you, where you can see the bone that is formed. This is the post-operative depth. The probing depth has reduced to around 2 mm. And here the probing depth has drastically reduced from 9 mm to around 4 mm, 3 to 4 mm, 3 mm. The next case I would be showing is resective osseous surgery, wherein after uh, raising the flap, you do an ostectomy or osteoplasty, that is, you contour the bone using the burrs, or you can even use bone files uh, if you're doing uh, manually. But I have used a burr. Uh, what is important while doing resective surgery is that you should have copious irrigation, copious irrigation while you are doing uh, an osseous surgery, because if there is heating of the bone, then there would be uh, necrosis of the bone in that region. So this is a case. Uh, we have done crown lengthening for this tooth, We've done soft tissue as well as osseous reduction. Here I have given a internal bevel excision so that I remove this portion of the soft tissue. So after removing this soft tissue, you can see the crown length has already increased. Soft tissue was reduced. In this case, the frenum of also impinging. So I've just given a small nick here so that the frenum does not impinge on the central incisors. Now the bone level was here. Now it, it has been reduced using burr to this level. No. The bone level, this is the bone. The bone has been reduced. And after bone reduction, we've given sutures and placed the pack. pack. So after seven days, we have reopened the site. So this is the post-operative picture. The crown length has been increased. Now, it is, uh, there's one thing you should be keeping in mind before doing a crown lending. What is the crown root ratio? Now, if the crown root ratio is low, is uh, not, it should be at least one is to one. The good is you have two is to one. So if the crown root ratio is, if the root is very small, then you should not go with any type of crown lending procedures. So you have to maintain that. And secondly, you have to maintain the biologic width during when you are doing a crown lending procedure. So that's why to maintain that biologic width, we have done soft tissue reduction followed by osseous reduction so that there is a distance of 2 mm at least from the alveolar crest. So this is the post RCT. We have done an RCT for this patient. Then a post and core was designed and a prosthetic rehab was done. Then comes your gingivectomy, gingivoplasty procedures where you do only soft tissue reductions for uh, hyperplastic gingiva or gingival overgrowths. So first uh, you should be knowing what is the cause of the gingival overgrowth whether it's just inflammatory overgrowth or it is drug induced or there is any other systemic involvement. So whatever is the cause, you should be first remove that cause and then go ahead doing the gingival surgery. So when you're doing an external bevel, you can use either a number 15 blade or you can use a Kirkland's and Auburn's knife. Now this patient had just an inflammatory gingival enlargement. He's a young patient. We have marked the supra bony pockets because we would not be doing any type of uh, osseous reduction. So we'll be marking the, only the supra bony pockets using a pocket marker. And these bleeding points have been marked. Then you just give an external bevel incision. How would that be? This is your tooth.
Yeah. And this is your gingival overgrowth. Okay. Now, what would be the direction of your incision? You would be giving an incision pointing towards from the apical to the coronal side, pointing to the pocket base. Okay. This would be the incision direction. This is an external bevel gingivectomy. What if you're doing an internal bevel gingivectomy? Your direction would change. This would be the direction if you're doing an external bevel. This is an external bevel and this is an internal bevel incision. Okay. So this one is an external bevel. We have placed the pack. And this is post-operative. Can you see a very nice scalloped contour, pink gingiva? Then comes your internal bevel. When would you do an internal bevel gingivectomy? You do an internal bevel gingivectomy when there is bone loss along with the gingival enlargement. So you don't want there to have recession. You want that CEJ to be covered with your soft tissue. So in those cases, you do an internal bevel gingivectomy. You mark your supraponi pockets. And this is, can you see the direction of the blade? This is an internal bevel incision that has been given. That's a continuous incision and a color of tissue has been removed. The flap has been positioned on top of the alveolar crest. Because there was bone loss in this region, we didn't want recession. If we would have done external bevel, we would have cut this portion of the gingiva. We don't want that. We want nice contoured gingiva. Can you see this? This is the post-operative picture. Uh, let me just discuss one mucogingival surgery for unectomy. You can use a laser for that. Uh, here, this patient has a high frenal attachment. Now, yeah, this is this is I'm doing a phrenotomy here using the radio surgery. You can use laser or you can use a scalpel. Your incision design remains the same. At the base, this is a phrenotomy procedure. There is a difference between phrenotomy and phrenectomy. Phrenectomy means you're removing a part of the tissue. Phrenotomy is you're just relocating the frenum. So this case is just you're relocating the frenum from this point to this point. Okay. So at the base of the frenum, you give a straight incision till the mucogingival line. This is the mucogingival line. So till this part, I've given the incision. And you just place a pack here. And after seven days, you would see this. This would heal by secondary healing, secondary granulation. So these are the cases uh, that I have shown you. There's one part I would uh, like to discuss is uh, you can use various methods. It's not about using a scalpel or using a laser or using a cautery or using a radio surgery. What is important for uh, doing a periodontal patient is your diagnosis, what to do when, and when to prescribe the correct medications. Uh, that is more important because these procedures are just technical skills. What makes you a physician or a doctor is what is your decision making? How would you treat a patient? What is important is your treatment planning that all, all your uh, prognosis will depend on treatment planning, not just for parentology, but all the uh, disciplines. And that is all uh, I wanted to share with you today. So we are dentists, we make the world a better place, one smile at a time. I would like to thank Vishal for helping me make this uh, presentation and my mentors, teachers, friends and students you know, who have helped me in each and every step of my life. Yeah, thank you. Any questions you can
email me. Uh, that's my department. Uh, I am at room number 404, Jamia Milia Islamia. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this wonderful, wonderful webinar. Uh, thank you for taking us back to our final year under graduation days and showing us the complete horizon of the periodontology altogether. Uh, it was a pleasure listening to uh, you from right from the diagnosis till your multiple cases. Thank you for showing your cases and in detail and noting it uh, with your ink and uh, showing us all the possible uh, treatment outcomes and everything related to uh, a general dentist perspective of dealing with periodontology. We have a few questions, ma'am. Uh, should we begin? Yeah. Uh, ma'am, in cases of endo-perio lesions, uh, what do you prefer, going with endo first or going with perio first? It depends on uh, what stage of the lesion is it. Is it a primarily endo lesion or is it a primarily perio lesion? How the disease has set in. But uh, with my personal experience, I would say you should do an endo first because uh, if you do a perio first, there are chances of a retrograde infection setting in. So if you do an endo first, or the second option is you do an endo and a perio at the same sitting. If you have that much of technical skill, you can do that. But it's better to do an endo first, let the That's epical right. tissues heal, and then do a perio yeah. treatment. Absolutely. Like uh, Ma'am, next question is, uh, what are the most common uh, problems that... Uh, that a dentist will face after a periodontal surgery, maybe a simple periodontal surgery to an extensive periodontal surgery, uh, what are the post-operative complications that can happen? Uh, what type of surgery are you doing? Ma'am, uh, any surgery. What are the most common uh, things that uh, in post-operative we, we can face off? See, well, if you are doing a, probably a simple flap surgery, if you're talking about, you can have some type of swelling in the patient. That swelling can stay up to 24 to 48 hours, but that if that swelling exceeds that time, then uh, you should find out the reason for that swelling. You can prescribe the patient some ice packs to be applied in that region. Uh, the second type of complication you can have is patient having bleeding from the bleeding site. So that can happen. Uh, if there is bleeding, then uh, ask the patient to immediately tell you that there is bleeding from that site and you find out the site, the cause of the bleeding with soft tissue, bone bleeding, or it's just a suture neck. Uh, so all those reasons that you have to find out. The patient might have a consistent pain. He might report you with pain. Most commonly, you would find the patient says the pain, that the pain is still there. So you can increase the dose of an analgesics because this pain depends on the patient's threshold. Now, uh, patients, after just patient may have done uh, uh, these bone reductions, those patients will have more pain uh, compared to just an open flap debridement because bone reduction is painful. So in those cases, you can increase the dose of analgesics that you are giving to the patient. So these are a few common problems that you would face after a periodontal surgery. Sometimes the patient might even say that he has some fever, but that is again just... Uh, uh, passing phase. It's not yes, that uh, it's not that just uh, that the patient has developed fever because of some problem. Because sometimes the patient are so delicate that they uh, are because of the trauma only they start developing those systemic symptoms. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, next question is uh, one of the most common uh, scenarios that uh, dentists face is patient do not get ready for periodontal treatment. Uh, since they, uh, the, the major complaint for which the patients turn up is the pain. And in periodontal uh, cases, like uh, the patient has a uh, hell lot of bone loss, periodontal pockets, and everything in their mouth. But uh, convincing a patient for a periodontal therapy is a huge task for <laughs> any, any dentist. So convincing the patient are... for a periodontal therapy is an art. <laughs> you have to tell him 
that he is suffering from a disease which he is not knowing that is uh, how would you motivate your patient patient yes See, uh, if your patient is has come to you because every patient is a periodontal patient when he comes to the clinic more than 80 to 90% of the population you would find that they have gingivitis at least gingivitis they have so uh, how would you motivate your patient for that uh, first and foremost if the patient has come to you with the chief complaint of bleeding gums or mobility or recession he would be easy to motivate but what if you have just found out during a routine examination that the patient has this problem so you can try to elicit history from the patient ki uh, whether you are having bleeding gums or you are having mobile teeth or you are having foul breath or you are something you try to elicit a history from the patient and then tell him that that problem is due to this particular disease that's happening right and try to motivate the patient for the oral hygiene so this is the only way to convince your patients because you can give them examples from other patients who have lost their teeth yes, yes. because of periodontal disease so this is another way uh you do a role play for those uh, patients you can show them your old cases who have had bad experiences because of not getting treatment at the right time yes ma'am yeah. absolutely true ma'am uh, ma'am uh, last question is uh, what is your take on using prf in periodontal therapies uh, since prf is not uh, easily available to uh, everybody Uh, what are the better substitutes uh, you would uh, recommend for in instead of prf if prf is one of a very cheap uh, alternatives to growth factors that are available in the market there are many other growth factors that are available but they are very expensive you have mtogain you have gem uh, uh, 21s but these are very expensive that not every patient would be able to oh, buy yes. them, afford those so prf uh, CPRF has a uh, very good results when you are doing a regenerative surgery now not every case you can do a PRF yes yes ma'am that's that that was my main motive of the lecture that that what would would your be what would be the treatment plan for the patient not every patient you are opening up the surgery surgical site and you are placing the PRF or you are placing the bone graft it would not help the patient there are indications for PRF that you you should be using PRF only in cases where you have deep defects if you have deep deep defects and you want a uh, bone regeneration and you think that the only bone graft would not be sufficient for that bone regeneration then you would place prf in those cases where you want to enhance the bone growth where you want to increase the bone regenerative capacity in those cases yes. or uh, you would do a uh, you can use a prf in soft tissue augmentation procedures not all the cases can be augmented every recession yes, case that walking into the clinic can can't you can't do soft tissue regeneration for those so you have very, yes, very small percentage of cases where you can do a soft tissue regeneration so when you are doing a soft tissue regeneration in those cases you can use prf uh, then but then again uh, it's uh, it's important how would you take the blood and how are you preparing that prf that has yeah, that yes, is important yes So with this, uh, we come to an end to our today's webinar. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, you. for your wonderful, wonderful lecture and uh, answering all our doubts and queries. Uh, I would like to thank my co-host, Dr. Ms. Ba Kadri. Uh, with this, uh, I invite Dr. Anmol Bagadia, uh, founder and CEO, to conclude this session. Dr. Anmol. Uh, good evening, everyone who are present here from India and all parts of the globe. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you are enjoying the learning experience with us. I would like to thank uh, Kirti Ma'am for uh, such an informative lecture and for giving her, us her valuable time this evening. Ma'am, perio forms a base of dentistry. The more we know about perio, the more uh, we improve uh, improve our skills for the other uh, diagnoses and treatments. So it plays an important role for the other fields to do their uh, diagnosis and treatment more accurate and to deliver more uh, successful treatment. So more we know about perio, uh, we do a better treatment. So this trips and tricks uh, tricks would help all the people who are viewing this lecture and to improve their practice. And ma'am, I would also like to thank you for being my mentor, my guide, and my support always. Thank you for inspiring me always. Thank you, ma'am. 
Thank you. Thank you and more for speaking as well. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Bye.